Okay. Well, Gene, thanks for coming, man. It's always a pleasure to be here and to have a glass of wine with you, Marcus. You think we'll just have one? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think my success is largely based on restraint. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it, does it count? Is it just one glass of wine if you continue to fill the wine glass up mm -hmm. before it empties? That's part of it. And, um, you know, when the doctors say to you, you should say, restrict yourself to, you know, two glasses of wine, make sure it's a goblet. Yeah. I mean, not one of those little things you get at the, uh, at a cocktail party at the Toronto Metro Center, things like that. No. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce you, Gene, a man who needs no introduction, Gene McBurney. A great, great buddy of mine who I love hanging out with, who we have spent countless hours together mm -hmm. doing all kinds of things, uh, always usually with a beverage. Oh, and, and or with and without. And with family. It's, uh, you know, I know uh, your, your lovely wife and the three kids very well. Mm -hmm. I've uh, cut records with... Um, uh, Theo with Theo, and uh, I think the Hall and Oates will be embarrassed if they were saw. That's right. The rendition of your kisses, your lips are on my, my your kisses on my. I forget the name of it. But your kiss is all I miss because your kiss is all my lips when I turn out the lights. That's it. Well, so Gene McBurney mining financier to the stars uh, was a hockey agent a corporate lawyer then teamed up with his good buddy brad griffiths to create griffiths mcburney and partners gmp a company that and i was doing some research a company that had revenues in excess of 200 million dollars had a massive market cap Mm -hmm. And, you know, you grew that so quickly and so steadily you had offices all over the world. You're flying all over the place. I think the first question that everybody who's listening is going to want to know is, um, how'd you turn that back into zero? <laughs> um, it, it took about five years, and I'm surprised it took us that long. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, we made some uh, we made some philosophical decisions that weren't in keeping with the culture of uh, GMP, and uh, we always thought that we could grow by by building, not by buying. And in our business, when you buy. You not only buy, uh, you know, there's the assets go up and down the elevator every night, which are the people. And uh, we always uh, believe that we can get anybody we want so long as we pay them instead of uh, buying the, the whole enterprise. Because when you buy the enterprise, you're buying the good stuff and the bad stuff. Right. And, uh, and the good stuff, <laughs> they can leave at any time. Now, you can tie them up with, you know, two years or three years or things like that. But most of the time, you're you're paying people a lot of money and they're cashing out. Uh, either, you know, not, not physically, but certainly a lot of them are mentally and things like that. Because in this business, you work so hard and so intensively, you know. You know, and some guys work till, you know, late in the evenings and... Uh, weekends and some guys just go go hard from seven thirty in the morning till uh, five o'clock at night. But it's it's always go hard if you want to be successful. You got to work hard, and it's a work hard, play hard environment. So it takes its toll. And but most importantly, what you know, what, what, so we we built out Switzerland, we built out uh, London, and we got the right people. And then when uh, I think we. 
we lost focus when we bought a place in New York or we bought a place in uh in uh, in Calgary and uh it uh the Calgary you know it coincided with the meltdown of the uh of the oil patching in in Alberta so the business wasn't as robust as it, uh, as it had been and um that's it so the uh but you know certainly we started off with in 1995, uh, just two partners, myself and Brad Griffiths, and we put 50 grand into it to start each. He lent me the 50. What a and, cool guy. Yeah, eh? And a uh, great guy, great friend, great mentor, uh, best banker, period. And uh, uh, we, then we went out and got two other guys, and they became equal partners, Brad and me. Uh, Mike Warkman and Kevin Solomon, and the four of us built the firm with the right people. Yeah. Do you think, like, I love the way you say that, right? Like, it started off, Brad Griffiths was like, I want you to be my partner. Mm-hmm. I think you told me, like, you were at lunch one day with him, and he was like, all right, well, Gene, do you want to be my lawyer, or do you want to be my partner now? Yep. And then you were like, well, Brad, I don't have the money. I think you were, like, ho- part-time hockey agent, part-time corporate lawyer at the time. And then he was like, well, I'll just spot you the money. Mm-hmm. And then when you brought on, when the two of you decided to bring on Weckerly and Kevin Sul- Sullivan, it, again, it's like your, your company was growing. You wanted to bring on talent. The common theme that I always noticed with you and the way you talk about your business and the way you operate your businesses is you're not like, you're not stingy with anything, right? Like, mm-hmm you are okay to overpay or to make concessions to bring the right team together. You think that's like the secret, like what, if I was going to say like, what's the secret sauce? I always thought that was kind of like. Yeah. Our business is a relationship business. So you have to have people who have relationships. They could be the best modelers. They can do black shoal model. They can do, but they have to have, relationships with people who will pay you fees and the smart clients know they have to pay the street fees uh, you know some uh, i i just had a, a meeting with one of my current partners and he was talking about you know we dealt with these guys for three months on a finance so we introduced them to people and then they went out and did an unbrokered uh, an unbrokered deal and uh Aren't there safeguards in place to prevent that? No, there's a trust, and that's what I say. You have to have a relationship. You have a relationship. Yeah, there's a, usually trust in that relationship. But in this particular instance, it was a, what I would call a, probably a rookie mistake, and um, and you know, and then you know, guy calls up and said, uh, "Well, you look, I'll you'll be part of the next one, but I'd really like to see a you know do a research report." Let me like that would have been a hang up on on I would have hung up on the guy um, because it's a you know one of my early clients said to me after we were leaving a meeting and uh, the broker said okay uh, the banker uh, I was a lawyer at the time you know, I'll raise you a hundred million dollars uh, but I'm gonna charge an eight percent fee and the norm would have been five to six percent but this was a an early stage company and i said why are you paying eight percent in fees i said you know you can he said if some idiot's going to give me a hundred i'm going to give him eight back and he said and he'll he'll research me he'll be there he'll follow me and you know and that's that's how you become successful in this business you you get to know your clients they 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 don't want to um they want you to make money if they make money and uh and everything we do is uh you know we don't get paid a weekly salary you don't get paid a monthly salary we get paid on success we, if we go out and take on a mandate to raise 100 million dollars and we only get to 80 and we can't close we don't get paid you know what else i find interesting is the number of people that we've met together that you've raised money for whose net worth is in excess of a billion dollars now. 
like you collided with them at some point. Obviously, they were on their own trajectory and they were going to mm-hmm. raise money and someone was going to do it. But the number of people you raised a ton of money for mm-hmm. that we've met, like we'll be sitting in a restaurant or like one time we were sitting on the beach in the Bahamas and some guy was sitting next to us and you were like, oh, I know this guy. I forget who that was. And you were like, uh, we raised him $100 million 15 years ago. Now that guy is worth $3 billion or $4 billion. Like the number of these stories that come out. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, I mean the and there's a lot of people who, who you know, who are broke. I mean, if they're in, they're in the gaming business or in the cannabis business or, you know, those. Uh, but you know, I mean, they would not be the ones that are successful. Are the ones that had successful assets, uh, but they were able to shepherd and steer them in the right direction and do the right things and have the right. Um, they had the right relationships, like. You know, if you're doing mining in Brazil or Colombia, you got to have relationships with the uh, politicians. And I'm not talking about bribery. I'm not talking about. You well, know, you wouldn't want to say that like on a podcast like this. No, right? I like, wouldn't want to do it. No. Uh, that's one of the first qu- things I have because I that stuff you can go to jail for, and that stuff you go to jail in Brazil or in Colombia. And I'm way too old and way too rich to spend time in a jail in Colombia or uh, yeah, but Brazil. you wouldn't be winning the beauty contest in the Colombian jail. No, no. I'm sure there'd be a cuter guy there. I'd be, a, <laughs> I'd be a top bunk guy. <laughs> so no, it's uh, um, no, we, we, we made very clear that, and it's all in our underwriting agreements. Things like that. There's no, uh, we, when we gave you money, we have a, a clearly defined use of proceeds and, um, we're in a position where we can uh, uh, monitor that as things go on. Speaking of of being trapped in a Colombian jail, how many times have you been married? Uh, I've been married four times. All Colombian? No. No, no I know. No, I know. No, I three. <laughs> but three out of four were lawyers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's, and all. Th- Every single one of them. They're lovely, delightful people. I enjoy a good relationship with, uh, with all, all, all of my exes. And luckily, I only had, chil- I had children only with one. And uh, I enjoy a, a good relationship with her as well. You got great kids. I do. I'm very proud of, uh, of them all and their successes. And their, um, they went through... Rocky times, and uh, they all emerged in their mid to late twenties as really good, fun kids. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Good. Right now, geopolitically, there's a ton of stuff going on. Right, mm-hmm. little tiny Putin invaded the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Xi Jinping is giving him a hand, mm-hmm. or at least sitting on his own hands while this goes on. Mm-hmm. And sleepy Joe Biden is uh, in charge of uh, the United States of America to some extent. Mm-hmm. If you were to pick a superpower, which one would it be? The United States. No, I just mean like, would you rather be invisible or be able to fly? But you have no choice of your superpower. You're, you've got a, um, you've got to. It basically, what an obligation to the world, rightly or wrongly, but you're you're no longer you can't have that uh, carry a big stick and uh, whatever Teddy was I think it was walk Teddy. slow walk but speak softly and carry or a big, big stick. stick something like that yeah. yeah I think that was Teddy Roosevelt uh, the, uh, but you can't I mean you can't be protectionist uh, Donald Trump tried to go down that route but it's and you know, I've often wondered if he want he wanted to leave NATO because nobody was paying their uh, their fair share, the NATO members, and you know he got people to uh, pony up more. But what would happen if the United States, you know, in the current context of the, uh, you know, the only reason I think that NATO is as strong as it is is now it's economically viable, and the United States is there leading the way and uh nato sorry nato is as strong as it is mm -hmm. like that strength in the defense that they came to to the neighboring country yeah the the coordination and how how successful they've been in 
countering the Russian attack of the Ukraine and yes, thus far. I mean, they're, I mean, who knows who's going to win and what's where, where this is taking us. Uh, but you know, now there's a U.S. uh, Congresswoman who is uh, questioning the the deployment of funds. She wants an account uh, accountability for where those funds have gone, and there's a whole bunch of, um, uh, I guess, uh, I think she's Republican, and she just wants to know. And I think it's a fair question because she's she knows the history of the Ukraine is uh, based on corruption. And uh, in recent years, and uh, she is making inquiry as to the accountability of it. So, um, I mean, the Ukraine's, you know, say all, all you want about the, right now, the Russians are only occupying 20%. Yeah, but it's and, like they're just going to continue to hammer and hammer and hammer. They, like, it, obviously, maybe... Uh, I, first of all, I think from the beginning, everyone misjudged Putin, right? Right away, everyone was like, oh, he's a dummy, and he's sick with cancer, and he doesn't know what he's doing. He's mm -hmm. gone mad. Don't you think that like the economic damage that he's inflicted on the United States G7 nations mm -hmm. by making this low and slow, ground and pound, long term, driving up inflation, affecting the prices of things that are inputs for everyone else in the world, continuing that level of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Like I heard some pundit on CNBC saying like, well, if the, um, actually, you know who it was? It was the guy, the CEO of Stifle said, you never know, like if the roar in the Ukraine ends, that could be a real positive stimulus for the market. Don't you think that like part of the, this war tactic, this well-designed war tactic is to inflict that level of economic pain on the G7 nations, like Germany is screwed right now. They just reduced capacity on that pipeline by 20%, right? Like, so he is winning. Like if Putin's end game is Look to at the grain. Pain, Look at the grain. Right. I mean, he made you, a deal in Turkey and then he came back and was like, ah, let's, boom, let's bomb Odessa. Yeah. Yeah. And the, so now you've got, as Canada has locked in oil, they've got locked in grain. They can't get it out. Uh, now we'll see in harvest time, harvest time is, you know, in August, September, and whether or not that that can be exported. Uh, but, you know, I completely share that view that, um, you know, that Putin may initially have thought, okay, I'm going to go in there, pound them, take them out, and boom. Uh, you know, it's, it's my country. It's back to being uh, part of the new USSR. But he when he found out it wasn't going to be that easy and the NATO alliance sort of came to the aid, he said, okay, fine. Now we're going to pound and ground and we're going to break their spirit. And I think that's what you're seeing now is, a, you know, cracks in the, you know, cracks in the, you know, people turning, people surrendering. But I would, I will say that, uh, you know, I think that, that you're absolutely right that, I think Putin underestimated it at the beginning. Uh, and then I think people, allies of ours, underestimated Putin's ability to, uh, to adapt. And now I got a parallel I want to draw for you. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the, this is like, we were talking about this earlier in the day on another uh, podcast. So the response to COVID was, blunt force trauma like let's just like get money out into the market it's the only way governments really know how to react right like we can't operate efficiently or effectively mm -hmm. so like we need to solve a problem here's the problem people are angry let's just fire a whole bunch of money at the problem don't worry everything's going to be fine it won't mm -hmm. be inflation it'll be transitory everything's going to be a-okay mm -hmm. the response to the ukraine was really similar. Like, so this U.S. Congresswoman, I don't know her name, but her question of accountability and accounting for where the money is going in the Ukraine and where the weapons are going is a valid one, but it's a valid one that will never get answered because the modus operandi of any government is you see a problem, knee-jerk reaction, 
throw whatever you can resources at it because hey we just got the green light from our people to green light throwing weapons and money into this black hole the problem will only be down the road when those weapons end up in the hands of enemies but much like in uh, afghanistan when they left everything behind uh, iraq every, yeah. every like every instance the knee-jerk reaction the non-strategic reaction to any of these crises creates and exacerbates any issue geopolitically. Well, but I, we've I, got a guy like Putin on the other side who's thinking many, many moves ahead. He, these aren't knee-jerk reactions that he's making. Well, he had to make, he had to make an adjustment because the, his initial thing was, okay, if you recall, he had the whole country of Ukraine surrounded and they were talking about, you know, taking out Kiev in, uh, in 30 days. Uh, so now he regrouped and, you know, has a, a, a ground and pound uh, strategy, keeping his uh, weapons far away from, uh, you know, like he's not, you know, his, in my view, He's used his troops as cannon fodder because a lot of the troops are being conscripted from the prisons. He doesn't care about the, those individuals. He changed his general early on. He got that new big fat guy now. Have you seen the picture of that guy? No, I haven't seen him. Now. So anyway, Matt, they, can you pull up a picture of the new fat general? Right, type in Putin's new fat general and throw it up. This guy's massive. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. Seeing. But what? What? So Putin was able to, uh, you know. And, and okay, I'll play the long game, okay? It's, uh, using NFL uh, metaphor, okay, we can't pass on these guys. We're going to have to just. Two, three yards of play. Yeah, you know, and and there's there's no clock on this. This isn't a 60-minute game. Well, the longer the game goes, the more he's winning anyways. Yeah. Because so, he's just inflicting more pain economically. And, you know, so I think I think the strategy is, uh, unfortunately, a uh, successful one. Because what I will say about, the, you know, the, there's another another prong, if you like, to that tuning fork. Um, the problem, let's throw money at it. Caveat: no boots in the ground. We're not going. We're not going to put Americans Americans at, at in harm's way. Heavily limited. There he is. This is the new general. I love reading certain things about people. One of them is this guy's diet, and he was like talking about like what diet? he drink he drinks one forty ounce bottle of vodka every day. It's like it it is the level of consumption that this human being well, is look operating at, at. Look at that guy. I mean, like yeah, he was retired. They brought him back in. Matt, type in whatever that guy's name is. His diet. It's the best. It reminds me of. Did you read the article about when James Gandolfini died? Sorry to interrupt this. Uh -oh. James Gandolfini died, right? He was at the Hassler Hotel in Rome when he died. And he had a heart attack. And they they said what he had, what he had been, what he had had that day, because he had ordered room service and then eaten out at the restaurant at the Hassler, which is a great, great restaurant. Yep. Great, top, right on the top. Top of the Spanish top. You're the best. There. You're the best. We should go for dinner there. Maybe at the end of the summer we can go for dinner there. I'll be in Europe. I know you will be. Uh, you have two parties that you have to go to that I wasn't invited to. Remember? Of course I remember. I was part of not inviting you. <laughs> Anyways, James Gandolfini, like the, his la it's like his last meal was like the right last meal. It was like he started off, he had six rum and Cokes, and then he got into the wine. He had like four orders of like nice uh, garlic shrimp. Uh, anyways, it just... It was just like a, like this, just you know, excesses of food. A death wish. That's what it was. Yeah, and then he died of a heart attack. Go figure. Mm -hmm. I just love hearing that kind of stuff. Okay, I gotta, I gotta switch. What is it? So uh, it says here that uh, he has five meals a day, washed down with at least a liter of vodka. That's great, yeah. right? I'm glad he's metric. Yeah. <laughs> Are the Russians on the metric system? Mm, yeah. yeah. I think so, yeah. Did you ever go to Russia for business? 
Uh, no. Uh, well, I went to Ukraine for business, but uh, it wasn't part of Russia at the time. Um, I've been invited many times. I financed over there, but I always sent somebody, one of my colleagues. So it just did. Uh, and a couple of times uh, there was closing centers in Moscow that were legendary. So. Really, hey? Mm hmm. Maybe we should do a deal in Russia. Not for me. <laughs> Venezuela? Venezuela, I think, of, uh, is in a, a watch and see mode because uh, I think it's too rich in natural resources not to get exploited. And I know the the big nickel mine there is allegedly up for sale, Loma de Nickel, um, and uh, it's got some of the best oil and gas reserves in the world. And it's you know it's got ports. It's near the United <laughs> road trip, <laughs> road trip. So are we going? I, We're going, right? I, I if, if I remember correctly, when Gene was here last time, he did say something like the, the same uh, same thing about Venezuela. Mm -hmm. About sure. the uh, it's a. I mean, we talk about it all. It's of time. opportunity. We talk about it all the time. We really want to go to Venezuela. Gene. Mm -hmm. No, there's opportunity. Yeah. No, yeah. and uh, uh, we'll. My right hand guy is a Venezuelan. Uh, he works out of New York, but he was, uh, but he grew up in Venezuela and Miguel educated as I am, and um, he he is not as bullish as I am. Oh, really? Do you think that's because he's kind of like tainted by being yeah, Venezuelan? It, he's tainted uh, because of the corruption. Right. Right. No. I but, guess. But, I mean. But, yeah. Joe B Biden was trying to make make nice with them, and um, the new president of uh, Colombia is trying to make nice with them. And not historically, Colombia and Venezuela didn't uh, um, get along. Joe Biden also trying to make nice with the Saudis now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. that didn't work. Sure, well, it, it got pushed back in the United States, but he still, you know, he still fist pumped, and uh, you know. And he believes them that he had nothing to do with Khashoggi's murder, and that flies in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. So, hey, you're friends with Bill Clinton? Not friends, I know. Him. Buddies, yeah. like you know, mm -hmm. what would Bill Clinton have done? What do you think he would have done? Contrary to popular belief, Bill Clinton is bloody minded. He's very, very strong, and. Uh, I don't think he would have cozied up to him. Uh, but it's at a different time. I mean, like, you know, you know, Joe Biden needs the the left to pursue the climate agenda, which means, I mean, I mean, the closing down of the Keystone Pipeline is just ridiculous. Um, the closing, you know, closing down of issuing permits on government lands is ridiculous. And uh, now they're now they're no longer energy uh, independent. They're energy dependent. So I don't think that like you you can't take events in isolation. You got to look at it, you know, in a contextual uh, thing. So I I don't think that Bill Clinton would have got himself in that in that way. In fact, when uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she approved the Keystone Pipeline. Hmm. So, you know, um, you know, I don't know what the connectivity of that is, but you know, the right now the United States needs uh, OPEC, and OPEC said we're not producing more oil because if we produce more oil, it's going to drive the price. Of, you know, economics one hundred and one. Bigger supply, price goes down, and we like it where it is, and we like it where it is. We're not going to produce more because. You know, contrary to popular belief, there's no shortage of oil in the world. Okay, Colombia uh, has got great oil and gas reserves. Venezuela's got great oil and gas reserves. Canada's got oil, great oil and gas reserves. It's geopolitical, to use your term, issues that arise that prevent those reserves from being tapped out, and and uh, the you know the and getting you know getting dispersed throughout the world. Uh, for instance, in Colombia, there's, it's there right now. There's a great push on to exploit the, um, 
the gas reserves that exist in uh, in Colombia, uh, which are huge. But Colombia has got a shortage of gas, so it's it's not for export; it's for import; it's for domestic, domestic use. use. And similarly, the um, you know if they free up things in Venezuela, that also. Uh, but you know, it's um, it, Joe Biden has dug a hole for himself uh, by pursuing this climate change. Well, agenda. he didn't dig it. He didn't dig it. It's like, it, it, the way I see it, it's like a constant pandering to the general public, right? So whether it's, it's to the general foreign public. policy or energy policy, it's like, okay, we want to be green. Well, we only want to be green up until the point that we've created a monster somewhere that's threatening our security and affecting how we do foreign policy. In which case, okay, maybe we should dial back the green and affect our energy policy a little bit to not be reliant on monsters to bring oil into our country when we can just drill holes in the ground, right? Like it's a balancing act. The problem is if you're balancing every time for four year stints, it's much more difficult to create a cogent plan to move forward, to move a country forward. You got to get everybody on board and you can't get everybody on board because you got tree huggers on one side that in the end will end up killing boots on the ground on the other side. Uh, you you can't pander, in my opinion, to 15% of the population uh, in order to, that will prejudice the other 85%. And uh, one of the things that I always quote is a, from a, a, a very good friend and uh, client of mine, Ian Delaney, and Ian Delaney ran Sherrod, uh, which was a nickel. Oh, yeah, a, a Cuba. Nickel, in Cuba, but he also had coal mines in in Western Canada, and that provided great cash flow for uh, Sherrod. And at every annual meeting, there'd be protesters there who would uh, protest doing business with Cuba, or would protest the coal mines in Western Canada. And when asked by one of the uh, interested parties who were against the coal mine uh coal mines that he needed that cash flow from the coal and um when asked about you know why don't you close those down and um uh, now these stats are dated somewhat but you know he he said look i'm a i'm an environmentalist and his wife is a very prominent fund manager my wife is an environmentalist we support a lot of environmental cause, but I know environmentalists, and there's two incontrovertible facts about environmentalists. They don't like to work in the dark or live in the cold, and 25% of the energy in the province of Ontario is coal-fired. Now, that's changed over time, and um, there, there's no pleasing you know, and that was his quote, but you come from that. There's no pleasing everybody all the time. And, uh, you know, the, you know, the people say, oh, well, we can't go. Here are your options. Uh, you know, renewable, you know, come, it's come a long way with wind and, uh, and solar, but it's still not the ultimate answer. It doesn't, it doesn't give you the ultimate solution to the energy consumption. Um, nuclear, oil, gas. And, um, you know, as I say, I don't know what the percentage is now of coal fire, but coal fire is, as I say, was 20 to 25%. It's more in um, other countries. Um, and the interesting thing is the EU has just come out and said, uh, you know, the lot of the environment paint with the same brush, oil and gas. The EU is now saying, no, gas is uh, green and oil is, is not. So if you unleash the gas reserves, it goes a long way to, to solving the climate crisis because- Gas is green now? According to you, yeah. But even fracking? Well, now you're talking about methodology. 
you don't have to frack gas. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, but when you do, that's still green. No, that's no. What they're they're saying is like, like take Colombia. That's they've got great uh, gas reserves. You drill. It doesn't emit the same uh, uh, pollutants that oil that oil does, and that uh, or the use of it doesn't produce the same uh, uh, pollutants. Uh, so, you know, gas is you know, gas could be uh, natural gas used in uh, it could be used in car. It'll still be a problem in cars, but a natural gas. You know, if you've got a natural gas uh, uh, fueling the uh, the your your oil and gas at your um, your energy consumption, then that's uh, that according to the EU now is it's green. Much and it's put in the same category. Now there's, I think there, there's a, there's some pushback on that, but what I'm saying is that there's there's an evolution in the um, in respect of uh, the the energy uh, efficiencies. You think changing our domestic energy policy, Canada and United States, let's just lump it all together, mm-hmm. yeah. can help us get out of the recession we are in or mm. going in? First of all, a recession is not something that's made in the United States. Okay, it's affecting everybody. Right. And uh, the high gas prices. Do you want a little more vino? Yeah, uh, the high gas prices are, is only one factor. But if you read, I think, the papers today, they are talking about how the oil and gas industry is a wash in cash. They're, you know, they, so I think they're, the answer is probably higher taxes, you know, on the oil and gas companies. Uh, I think the, uh, the, you know, the, I, there's an old expression that Brad Griffiths used to use, and it was, uh, if a shark stops swimming, it dies. If an oil and gas company stops exploring, you know they're they're valued on what they're producing and what they can produce. If you say, "Oh, my production is running out because I haven't been able to explore," then you got problems, and um, that's the one of the major issues that's going on right now in the world. But they're still producing; they're still stockpiling cash, and they're keeping that cash. But they're not exploring. They're not. Well, no, they they can't. I mean. If you look at Western Canada, sure they're still they're still exploring, they're still uh, doing things, but they can't get their oil. They can't gas. get it out. They can't. They, they got shut in uh, right. gas. Uh, they got shut in oil. They can't. Get, there's no pipeline. Yeah, but I'm sure Trudeau has a plan. That's good. I'm glad you have that. <laughs> Are we in a recession right now? No. Are we going in a recession? I don't think so. I don't think it's as bad as that. Uh, you know, I think we're we're going through, uh, yeah, you know, especially in energy costs. And again, it's you know, it's just not a, it's, you know, one falls into the other, into the other, into the other. So, you know, you you look at when there's higher energy costs, so your Uber driver is going to be more expensive. Your delivery guy from Pizza Pizza. It's going to be more expensive. I got sticker shock when I got. I was away for about two months from Canada. I came back to the restaurants and all the patios are open. It's great, and I'm looking at the prices. They're selling steak at some of these pa- patios for 125 dollars for a steak. I remember you spent 35 minutes of our lunch talking about it. Okay, okay. So, well, I don't know. Wait till you see how expensive this place is tonight. Okay. And I hope you brought your credit card. I did. <laughs> because I left you with the bill the last time. That, That's all right. Uh, so That's all right. I'll uh, be staying at your place in the Bahamas. Well, you win. <laughs> <laughs> how much fun are we going to have in the Bahamas? Oh, it's going to be work. It's going to be, yeah. It'll be, it'll be good. Okay. I got a, qu- a couple questions for you. So we, like I sent out an email mm-hmm. to my office. Who you know, most of the people that I are in the office. Of people, yeah. Some of them are actually here right now watching the uh, 
Mm -hmm. us chat, which is fun, right? Like, but just they got excited, right? And um, I asked for- Is that because most of the people on your program are stiffs and you've got a a real guy here tonight? Is that the, uh, or is there is there a bigger reason? Is there- um, I wouldn't say- We that, can say that Justin's a stiff. Yeah, I wouldn't say that <laughs> Justin's a stiff. Um, like it's a little stupid, maybe. <laughs> No, no. Honestly, we have a great time together. And um, I know that you're a little bit jealous because I'm spending time with Justin doing the podcast. Um, there's no need to get mean about it. I'm not, I'm not being mean. I'm just trying to be uh, uh, bring some perspective to you. Yeah. Um, you're talking about Justin Trudeau, right? No, yeah, Justin Turner. So uh, I'll tell you, uh, definitely, <laughs> def definitely, definitely. Um, a lot of people voiced some concern and they wanted more interesting people. And um, you weren't on the top of the list. <laughs> but, so the uh, first, okay. Okay. So we got some questions. Okay. Yep. I'm going to start off with the most kind of serious business oriented questions that I got from the staff. The first one is a little bit of a math question. How many second graders? Would you be able to beat up before being overtaken? I would say a very f minimal because I'm a very gentle individual. I don't believe in violence. And uh, they, if they were attacking me, they probably would believe in violence. So I'd surrender almost immediately. Oh, here's a good one. If you had to start a business today, what business would you start? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I really believe in do what you are, and uh, it depends on with whom. I would never start up a business by myself. I'd start up a business with uh, who I believe people who are much more talented than I am. So me. Uh, yeah, you. Um, obviously, would be at the top of the list. Um, I would... Do you want some more wine, by the way? Oh, no, this is a different bottle. This is That's okay. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I think that it would be, uh, I mean, I'm in the financial services business um, and be in the financial services business. Um, I think that there's, uh, you could uh, definitely, uh, you could definitely, yeah, uh, there's, we're right now, we're overbanked. And of course, the whole banking business is uh, run by an oligopoly in Canada, which, may, which makes it difficult because not only are they banks, but they also are in the asset management business and our clients are the asset managers. So, um, but it would be something to do with the financial services business. Man, you know your audience, eh? If you were to go into something, it'd be financial services related. Mm -hmm. Maybe even finding a way to help Canadians borrow money more effectively and help them lower their cost of capital. Mm -hmm. Just like something near and dear to my heart. And you know, I know that you know, as a financier, we're always worried about the numbers, but there's, a, there's something we say about owning your own home and having you know, the stability of home ownership and this you know, it's good for the family. It's good for your state of mind and uh, having access, you know, to your own ground, I think is very, very important. You know, we love like connect. We love what we do. It's easy to get good people to work at the company mm -hmm. because we're helping everyone that's calling us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're picking the right people. We're giving them the amount of money that they need and we're helping them fix something. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, it's not even something that's deficient with the client, right? Like it's, listen, things are changing. It's I part of what I call the oligopoly. Right. You know, there's, there's five banks in this country that dominate. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I talk to, you know, uh, you know, I'm an international financier. I, that I sounds do, so good, eh? Yeah, it does. Really. Does that work yeah, on the chicks yeah, or what? I, I don't no, I don't use that. Oh, um, the but people like when you start, you know, yeah, having discussions about, you know, 
the macro in terms of where's Canada sitting? They can, in Canada, we dominate in, in natural resources and natural resource financing. And, um, you know, the other parts of the world follow. And a lot of a lot of times when we market a deal, we'll market it in Canada, and they'll say, well, "Oh, what are the Canadians doing?" So that you know, we'll say, "Okay, well, yeah." Then they'll follow what the Canadians are doing or the uh, U.S. Uh, people are doing. But what's really, really important is, you know, how difficult it is to compete with the banks uh, because you know they. They have the, you know, they've got lobby groups. There's no brokerage firm that's not a bank owned firm that has a lobbying firm in Ottawa. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, or in Washington. Uh, there's no, um, there, you know, there's, they, when they have hearings up in Ottawa, they call it like GMP was one of the most prominent financiers in the country. Not once were we ever called. For a parliamentary hearing to, you know, to voice our concerns about certain things. Okay, they they didn't involve you when they bought the TSX. They never. You know what? Uh, the which was like totally non affecting of competition, right? Anyway, I I won't comment because my great partner Kevin Sullivan's on the board of uh, TSX as an independent director. Hmm. So, um, the so what I. But that gave rise, the T, the bank's involvement with the privatization of uh, the, T, the TSX, that gave rise to the Neo Exchange. So there's some very good benefit. The Neo Exchange is very consumer friendly, both from an investor point of view and from a company point of view. Um, and it'd be great for the guys that own it when the banks buy it when it gets big enough. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, I don't own it. But, yeah. Uh, you know, it's good for guys like Perry to Perry Delise, Delise, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, but full credit to them. Uh, nobody got rich counting other people's nickels. If they get if if they got bought out by the, I doubt it'd be the Toronto Stock Exchange. They'll get bought out by, you know, Chicago Mercantile or got by, you know, by a foreign, uh, you know, Frankfurt or something like that. Uh, but Good for them. No, I, listen, I like the parallel that you draw because you started a brokerage business. You fought the banks. Like you went in. I remember. So I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but we never fought that. We competed with the banks and nine times. And, and it was very strategic what we did. We did not go into areas where we couldn't compete. We could compete in oil and gas. We can keep compete in mining. I can't compete in a, for a chair issue for National Bank of Canada. I can't compete for, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the, we did a lot of business for Shaw, but when Shaw went out and issued a preferred chair. It wasn't I, GMP that was doing GMP, it. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, Shaw used to own Chorus. I used to do a lot of business with John Cassidy at, at Chorus and, uh, you know, both M&A and, and other things. And, you know, the, um, you know, when Fonarola, which is a uh, internet service provider, and a, uh, you know, we used to do a lot of bi business with them. And Fonarola? That, yeah. That sounds like a company that went bankrupt. No, it got, it got bought. Uh -huh. People got made money. Oh, okay, great. That was, so, that's great. Uh, I didn't mean that you fought the banks. I just mean that you fought we, for your slice of the pie we against competed the banks. With, we competed with the banks. And we had, we had, generally speaking, better people than the banks. Okay, because we did not have uh, a balance sheet. We could always rent a balance sheet, but yeah, yeah, we we did not have. Like, we never, ever, uh, didn't participate in a deal because it was a bought deal. You know, we had, wow. we, we had, uh, uh, we had a good balance sheet. What we did have was we had people who would make that, those judgments and say, yeah, we can sell this, or yeah, let's go and do this. And I mean, what, uh, Brad Griffiths uh, had a very good relationship with the buy side. So he'd go over and visit 
Mr. A at the buy side, who was a strong asset manager, and he'd say, uh, you know, give me, let's throw some ideas around. What do you think of this? What do you think? Oh, I don't know. So one day the, he said, you know, what I'd really like is, you know, um, tech uh, and InMet. InMet's got a big position in tech, and InMet's in pro uh, problems now. Why don't you, um, if you can get me that block out of InMet, I'll buy, I'll buy it all. But more importantly, if you get it, I want to be guaranteed half. No writing, no nothing like that. Handshake deal. Guaranteed half? What do you mean? It, so if they own 100 shares of, uh, InMet owns 100 shares of tech, they'd buy all 100. And, but if we, if we got the mandate, he knew there'd be enough demand that he wanted to get at least 50. So, you know, and that's, you know, that wouldn't, you never think of those things at the banks. Right. Because they well, you're risk averse. Well, you're not getting paid also, to take those also, risks. Also, they have walk-in business and they have tied and they're tied selling. I can't tell you how many times I was working on an M&A. But banks aren't allowed to tide sell. Them. Oh, yeah, right. I didn't get that memo. It's on the uh, Government of Canada website in financial services. Okay. That they're not allowed uh, to tide sell. sell. Yeah. So um, I can't tell you how many times it happened where I come up with an idea. I go to the company. I Oh, that's a good idea. I think you should, you know, you, you should take out the uh, ACO. Oh, yeah, I'll take out ACO. Okay. And then you get a call from the client uh, because one of the banks uh, used, you know, gave them debt. And they said, uh, Gene, you got to co-lead this with uh, BMO, RBC, Scotia, whatever it was. Why don't I have to, it's my idea. We can do it all. Uh, well, you know, they're my bankers. Uh, they give me, uh, you know, my debt. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to. Uh, so Don't want to upset them. You know that the Bank of Canada did a study for mortgages. I know I got to tie it back to mortgages because it's well, all I know. Sure, for sure. But they did a study for mortgages and they were like, how Canadian consumers can get the most out of their bank. And they said, the number one way is to show your bank, your primary bank, that you have dispersed your assets and debt equally amongst all of the banks because then they'll compete for your business more. Mm -hmm. But if you're tied to just one bank and you have loyalty to one bank, you will not receive the full impact of fiscal stimulus that's being pushed into the market from the Bank of Canada. Read reduction in rates, increase in money supply, whatever it is. But if you're loyal to one bank, you're never going to get the full discount off of a rate. And the other thing, well, that's absolutely true. And what is abundantly clear is that you know the bank manager at you know lure and ossington uh has a ba has a separate balance sheet and so he can't afford to have you go across the street from cibc to bank of, no, unless there's a compelling reason for it and what they and what was told to me by an ex-banker um you know not a not an investment banker, but a banker, is that they the pressure on these local managers is huge. And the pressure on them, because there's a whole lot of people coming up, so you got to be, you know, don't make too many mistakes. Um, but the, the pressure comes from, you know, head office saying, look, we don't want Mr. and Mrs., X is business if it's a one-off mortgage. We want them to have a Visa or MasterCard. We want them to have a a, a line. We uh, we want them to, you know, we want to integrate them, you know, so that they're they're our clients, and um, you know, provided they're good credit risk. It's just funny that like the same tactic that they employ against like <laughs> this billion dollar business that you created mm -hmm. whereby like okay gino you go you come up with this creative financing strategy for gold corp and build uh, you know build a way for them to ingest 300 mm -hmm. million bucks worth of capital on a bot deal that gmp is doing 
and you go and run and, and, and put that together. But at the end of the day, we know we're going to get the last crack at it. And we know we're going to find a way to force our way in. I'm not saying Gold Corp. I'm no, not just but, saying like. No, but uh, Marcus, you're absolutely right. But they control 85% of the business. Right. So you've got a bunch of independent entrepreneurs. I, I did not only, I not only competed with the banks. I competed with the entrepreneurial, you know, the, the small, the Yorktons and the uh, Gopal Shields and the uh, uh, first marathons and things like that. Now, most of those companies were taken out by the banks. If they're really successful, and we had overtures to go with the bank. But as somebody once told me, he says, we just, we knew if we went to, we, you, you couldn't live with our bank culture. And that's true. We could not. We were t far too entrepreneurial. I just mean that like, so what we deal with on a daily basis yeah, I mean, is way smaller of a scale, right? So like we'll put together but, a structure. But, but it's way smaller. But let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah, sorry. It's far more important than what we do. I mean, we, we foster capital for businesses, which is good. You provide life and lifestyle to your client base. And your client base is, you know, is are people who, who may not qualify because of the, you know, the change in legislation in a bank or the, uh, you know, the loan to value uh, equations change and things like that. And, you know, what, what does somebody do? Like, okay, fine, you've got a $700,000 mortgage. Uh, uh, sorry, we can only give you 500000 because of the loan to value. Through no fault of your own, the, you know, the, the, the market's gone down. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, given where the market's gone over the past. But it's, that's where it's going right now. It's going so it's right, you're 100% right on. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, right. and that's the whole thing is that, you know, the, you know, through no fault of anybody, you know, the value of their home has gone down and uh, they can't get the same mortgage. So, oh, what are they going to do? Oh, you got to downsize. I Who just, wants to downsize? You got to take your kids out of school. You got to leave your neighbors. And I mean, it's prudent to downside, but there's a volatility. Like in the United States, you get 30 year mortgages. Canada, we're at five. And for the most part, yeah, partially amortized. Yeah. Yeah. I just like this, like I see such a parallel to our business. So I know, right? Like I see, and I like I used to be on the phones with clients all the time, right? Used to get a client call in. The client would say, like, okay, I'm buying a house, and I have a house already, and I have an apartment building, and I want to figure out what the best way to finance this new purchase is. And you go through it, and you figure out like what the rate on the apartment building is, what the rate on the house is, what the going rate on the money he's going to need for the new purchase is. You figure out what the break penalties are on each of the existing properties. You look to see whether the trend is for a variable or a fixed, what the Bank of Canada is looking to do. Analyze whether there's net savings associated with breaking one of the existing mortgages to take money to put into the new property. Find out what the cash flow on the new property is, where the tax advantages are, with respect to holding the debt, knowing that even utilizing the debt from the home, still tax deductible on the investment property. And you put together a coherent strategy. You sit down with them and you've spent, you know, for me, 15, 20 minutes, because I'm really no, bright. No, but well, that's but a whole point. You spend some time going through it yeah, and you sit uh, down and you bring it to them and they say, amazing, thank you very much. And they go to their bank and they bring the strategy and the bank executes the strategy. And what they don't realize, and like, listen, the consumer is in is is in love with having a good relationship with their bank, and you can't blame them for it. Right? No. Everybody wants to have a good relationship with their bank. But what they don't realize is, especially early on in our business, in Connect's business, it kills us. Because we don't make anything unless we do a deal. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, in the mortgage business, if your client goes to the bank with a really good idea that the mortgage broker came up with, the bank isn't calling the mortgage broker saying like, hey, we'll split this with you, which I know you've mentioned that happens sometimes happened in the past with GMP. It doesn't happen in our business. In our business, it's you might get a phone call from the banker saying like, hey, good strategy here. Like, mm. thanks. So, Or if you got any more of those guys, send them to me. Right. So it's what, what, 
the consumer needs to realize is this, and you know what, we're kind of past it now with the size of our business where we can afford to, you know, kind of our whole tagline, sound unbiased mortgage advice, push out great advice to people and kind of cross our fingers and just rely on the good nature of people to, to say like, okay, we got a solution from somewhere. We're going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. And for the most part it works, but I can't tell you like this game plan that you talk about. It, it's like, it, I would say it infuriates me. It used to infuriate me. Now it no longer infuriates me. It's just kind of par for the course. Like for instance, you know, you're doing a mortgage for somebody where they're refinancing. They have a high interest rate mortgage with their bank. They got offered a garbage mortgage rate to refinance. They needed more money. The bank told them, A, we can only give you 50 grand. The guy wanted 100. The rate we can offer you is four and a half. The guy knows he can get four. We do a deal for him where he's getting 100 and his rate's four. We ask for a discharge statement from the bank that he has his mortgage at. The first thing the bank does is call the client up and say, hey, sorry, we made a mistake. We'll give you the hundred. We'll give you the four. Lose connect. And it hurts. It doesn't hurt me anymore. It hurts me when I look at the numbers on a month to month basis, but it demoralizes the guys on the ground, right? Yeah. And I can only imagine the same thing happening at GMP in the height of GMP when the banks were like, I, I, listen, I worked at Scotia Capital when G, in 2001, 2002. And I remember going to our Monday morning meeting. Our head of sales was a guy named Lori Lewis. And I remember going to our Monday morning meetings and hearing these were the numbers last week. GMP was number three in total trades for the TSX this week, last week. How are we letting this happen? We need to get better numbers. We need to figure out what deals they're doing. We need to get into their clients. Who's writing reports on their companies? Like, trust me, they know. But the only well, tactic they have to... Well, I, and I can say that they're, even though their numbers are wrong, because we were always number one. We were never number three. In the trading statistics, Mike Weckley dominated the trade. And we didn't do every... We did not do like, you know, when you talk about trading stats, you're talking about every company on TSX. We didn't do, you know, we didn't do real estate. We didn't do, uh, you know, healthcare companies. We did mining, oil and gas, automotive, steel, uh, those bread and butter accounts that are liquid. And we created a liquidity. We put a balance sheet up. Uh, but the, yeah, I mean, that's, that was the strategy. It's just so funny, the parallels between your massive business and my tiny business. Do you know business, what I mean? Your business is good, but, but I, you raised a good point earlier, is that you know, somebody's going to come in and say, I've got you know, apartment building, I've got this, I've got that, and he'll look at this once every five years. You're looking at this five times a day, if not more. Yeah. Okay. So you have an expertise. And that bank manager, you know, we said it was at Bloor and Ossington or wherever he is, up in Don Mills. He is not. I'll do you one better. I'll do you one better. The National Housing Act mm -hmm. has a section in it regarding education. Within that, it exempts any employee of a bank from having to have any accreditation or education relating to mortgages whatsoever and still able to sell mortgages and trade in mortgages. The only people that and need that, to have any education and, are brokers. That's, and, and that's an advantage for us. That should be your advantage. But it, you go back to the, you know, to the square one, and the, and the square one that I, I was talking about is that you know, 90%, 99%, of the population doesn't know GMP. A hundred percent of the population knows. Bank Gene McBurney? I don't know, 50. Uh, <laughs> Bank of Montreal, Scotiabank, uh, National Bank, CIBC, the, you know, the five main banks. And that name recognition is, you know, it does two things. It gives them a lot of business, but it breeds mediocrity. I think it really also, when I, like, when I see bank ads, mm -hmm you see how out of touch they are, right? 
they're really talking down to the consumer. You're richer than you think, mm. right? Like come and sit in the comfortable green couch. I don't know whatever bullshit lines they have for the rest of it, but they're really talking down to people. And I mm. think I, I disagree with you. I think we're in a recession. Mm. I think things are going to get, just leave it, leave it here. Knock them all over. Knock them all over. You got to make money count. Knock, I, we, I will. Those little things don't make money count, Gene. Don't worry. Okay, okay. I need you to relax and be happy. Knock that thing down. If it makes you happy, knock it down. Well, that's good. Yeah. So I think that that because I, I, so I do believe we're in a recession. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that instances like this, when the economy turns and money becomes more scarce and people's cash flow gets tighter, I think they're going to start, everyone always starts kind of paying more attention, right? And they'll pay attention to these types of small things. And if they're being continued to talk down to by the banks, they're going to find other options. No, I, well, I agree. I mean, that's one. That's your competitive uh, uh, opportunity. But having competed with the banks for 25 years, they're going to be, they're here a lot longer than GMP was. They're going to be here a lot longer than Connect is. They, so it makes, that's why you work harder and you work smarter and you're more successful. Okay. You're, you know, you, I mean, you know people like Gene McBurney. The guy at, that's big. The, the guy at Blue and Ossington doesn't know him. <laughs> that's big. Hey, um, I want to ask one um, one last question, which I, if I didn't ask, my buddy Steve Kutcher would be pissed. Okay. All right. So, um, did, first of all, did you ever did you ever go to the World Economic Forum in Davos? No. Loser. Mm. They didn't invite you. I snubbed them. Did they invite you? It's not the question. No, that was exactly the question. No, I've never been invited. All right, we should go. I think just to see what these guys are doing. They're probably like drinking the brains of children or something weird going on there, right? I have no interest in doing that. Okay, drinking the brains of children or going to Davos? Both. Okay, <laughs> just checking. Okay, so what do you read into? the great reset conversation that happened it at the world economic forum around utilizing economic calamity to change the way governance is done around the world and using it to bring corporations in not only as stakeholders but almost like custodians into world governance and keeping governments as just one of the stakeholders like you, you have you read anything about this like this is like i to answer your question no i'm not but i i understand your question and i think that Universal compliance is a very difficult thing to get. Yeah, but if you introduce massive inflation, and then everybody will uh, react to their own. Like if you sit here and you say, "Okay, Marcus, you you think we're in a recession, and the recession is brought about by uh, by inflation," then you sit there and talk to the economic advisors to the president of the United States. We're not we're not in a recession. Then you talk to the why are they saying that, by the way? We're in a recession. Interest, listen, hang on, hang on. It's, You're, it's listen. political because nobody wants to be the author or the person in power when a recession comes because people are not going to say, oh, this is because of the war in the Ukraine. But this, this guy doesn't even know he's in power. Joe Biden doesn't know he's in power. Come I'm on. I'm not going to get into Whoever that. fell up a set of stairs before? No, I'm, he I'm, fell up the stairs twice. He doesn't know where he is that that's an issue that uh uh as a non-voting um united states citizen you know i you know i have my own views but i mean it, then you go back to what's the alternative much like the situation you have here in canada what's the alternative why don't you come back become a canadian citizen and run for prime minister. I'm still a Canadian citizen. A oh, sorry. A resident. Yeah, a 
product. Uh, because I could be the uh, deputy prime minister. You could be if I were in that position. My good friend, Kevin O'Leary, ran. He doesn't speak French, though. Uh, yeah. Mais tu parles français. Très bien. Je parle français. Avec, avec Vous êtes une étudiante de McGill. Je parle français avec un accent québécois. So it's magnifique on, on Canada. Yeah. You uh, win, apparently, you win the vote by the time it crosses over, right? So, but uh, it's, uh, no, I have no political ambitions. What if we did it together? I have no political ambitions. Can you imagine the chicks we would get? I have, I'm happy. I don't, <laughs> I'm happy. You're not going to trap me in that sort of discussion. The, uh, it was actually one of the questions on the list, by the way, hmm. from Phil Edwards. Oh, here, I got another quick, quick question. But his question was, where is it? Dominate an industry. Oh, here. Listen to this statement and tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Gene McBurney for prime minister. There you go. It's a good one, right? Ridiculous. Uh, vous êtes stupide. Okay, here's one. Honestly, here's one that I, I don't know if I can listen to the answer to, but I'm going to ask it. Who's a better dinner date? Me or Gled? You're about the same to start, <laughs> but you have longevity. <laughs> oh, great. I like that answer. Oof. Let's make sure that's a highlight, huh? Like on the reels, this is a highlight. Gene, this is the best. Marcus, I enjoyed this thoroughly. And you know what the funny thing is? Is we're going to go and talk shit <laughs> for the next four or five hours anyways. Yeah, and I can... It doesn't get old. No, it doesn't get old. But I'll tell you what, people get old, and I don't want to be the Canadian Joe Biden. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but dude, you're so sharp. Uh, but, you're you know, so sharp. Uh, yeah, look, I'm... Knock on wood. Yeah. So I wouldn't... Uh, Canada needs clarity of vision and what I would call mental toughness. And uh, they, you can't go by the women of uh, the guy. There's no doubt in my mind Justin Trudeau, you know, wants to make res a restitution to the Aboriginals. And that's a very, very good lofty goal. But if you're focused, if, you're, if you become a, a single focus leader, there's so many things left at the, you know, on the sidelines. And, uh, you know, if I were in a position, I would, I commend what the Pope did over the last two days. I so strongly support it. Then I read in the paper, it's not good enough. What's he supposed to do? Like what, what possible, he came over here and apologized. He had the, he, had he wore the, the headdress and everything, right? Yeah. The, 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 and the, there's a very good article uh, in today's newspaper about the importance of getting that. So the leadership of the of the aboriginal peoples and uh, you know are supporting that first step as he called it and he's calling for an investigation how did it happen which puts focus on his constituency um but you know the, the, today i'm reading in the various uh, uh, media about not good enough i think that's okay Honestly, you want to know why I think that's okay? I think it's okay because it's part of the healing process for them. I think, like, they had such a trauma inflicted on them. It's and, like, if you've been, like, if you've been in that type of a situation where, like. None of us have. Right. That's what I mean, right? Like, but can you imagine some massive, like, genocidal chain trauma that's been inflicted upon you? Not maybe at the hands of directly, but definitely involved in with the catholic church even after you even after they say i'm sorry i love you it's okay you can still be mad it's okay it takes a little while to get no, over it I, let them get over it that's okay I, maybe I, they won't get over I it i agree with what I'm saying. I just, it, 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 they didn't go far enough that was the expression that that stuck they're angry me. they're angry okay well, it's okay they're allowed to be angry 
Let them be angry. Should, uh, it, it's a national disgrace. It's a national embarrassment. And uh, I just wanted to commend the Pope. 